Oh, my goodness. Look at this. We are so excited to see you all today. Uh, I can't tell you when we're, those of us who are sitting in a room and thinking, who is it that we should bring? Who is it who's going to stimulate the campus? And we, and we think, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And then this year, oh my goodness, when we thought, uh, when we uh, came upon this particular name and this particular book, the enthusiasm in the room was was just unpalatable. So I really have to stop going off script. I'll go back on, because I did script myself so that I would be very short and to make sure that we did hear uh, the wonderful words of our speaker today. Oh, by the way, we were concerned about whether we, can you hear me? How about the people in the back sitting on the floor? Good, take a communication class, you learn to do this. Anyway, when you hear, <laughs> when you hear the phrases, Cadillac driving welfare queens, a food stamp president, and lazy, dependent, entitled freeloaders. What comes to mind? More interestingly, what's the picture in your mind? Are they simply, are they just simple descriptions? Or are they a kind of coded racial language that our guest speaker writes about in his book, Dog Whistle Politics? Now let me just give you a little clue about this. I first heard about dog whistle politics listening to my favorite NPR station. I was so taken with that interview that I rushed out to my local independent bookstore and bought a copy. Before I even completely finished it, I ordered it for my class in African American rhetoric. That, um, and taken together with our other texts, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, Douglas Blackman's Slavery by Another Name. My students and I engaged in a semester-long exploration of how discourse, often emanating from politicians and elected officials, constructed and reconstructed the ways in which African-American identity and community were framed in the minds of Americans, indeed of people around the world. I could tell you, though, that the most amazing part of that semester for me was not just the great conversations that we had, but the fact that my students read Dr. Haney's book before I even assigned it. Now that's a good book. So why do I begin with this story? Because as individuals and a nation, we want to figure this race thing out. We need to figure out why this social construct continues to constrict the lives and opportunities and possibilities of entire communities. Our speaker here today will help us meet this need. Ian Haney Lopez is the John H. Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley, where he teaches in the area of race and constitutional law. He is one of the nation's leading thinkers on racism's evolution in the United States since the civil rights era. Dr. Lopez's current research emphasizes the connection between racial divisions and the growing wealth inequality in the United States. In his book, Dog Whistle Politics, How Coded Racial Appeals Have Reinvented Racism and Wrecked the Middle Class, Professor Lopez reveal, reveals how over the last 50 years, politicians have exploited racial pandering to convince many voters to support policies that ultimately favor the wealthiest while hurting everyone else. Our author is also, uh, has also written the book White by Law, as well as Racism on Trial, books that explore the legal construction of race. As a constitutional law scholar, he has written extensively on how once promised legal responses to racism have turned into restrictions on efforts to promote integration. He has also been a visiting law professor at Yale, New York University, and Harvard, where he served as the Ralph E. Scheich's visiting fellow in civil rights and civil liberties. He holds a master's degree in history from, the, from Washington University, 
a master's degree in public policy, he's got it covered here, from Princeton, and a law degree from Harvard, and is the past recipient of the Alphonse Fletcher Fellowship awarded to scholars whose work furthers the integration goals of Brown versus the Board of Education. He currently serves as a senior fellow at DEMOS, a multi-issue national organization that combines research, policy development, and advocacy to influence public debate and catalyze progressive change. Villanova community, it is my pleasure to, to welcome the Martin Luther King Day celebration speaker, Professor Ian Haney Lopez. Hey folks, good evening. How are y'all doing? So that was that, you know, you're taking that as a rhetorical question and the right rhetorical answer is doing great. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, so so this past weekend, I marked the inauguration of Donald Trump as president by going back and reading a book whose title is this, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? That book was written by Martin Luther King in 1967, 50 years ago. And who was King in 1967? He had seen the great triumphs of the Southern Civil Rights Movement, the end of segregated lunch counters, the end of Jim Crow legal segregation. He had been party to participant in the signing of the great 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But by 1967, he had also witnessed the fact that very little integration had actually occurred in the South, that school segregation had worsened in the North, that the federal government invested virtually no resources in enforcing the 64 Civil Rights Act or the 65 Voting Rights Act. By 67, Martin Luther King had actually moved to what he called the Deep North, Chicago, to live in a ghetto to understand what it meant to be African American and trapped in a northern city. And it's in this context that he writes the book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And he advances three points that I want to fully endorse, and I want to repeat them, I want to lay them out here, and they're implicated in what I'm going to talk about. One, he recognizes that for people of color, the most important, the most damaging aspects of racism are really not attitudinal. They're structural. He recognizes the way in which poverty in particular traps so many African Americans so that they had almost no contact with whites. What did they care if some random white person might be biased? They never even interacted with them. What they cared about was being trapped in a ghetto where housing and food actually cost more than in the suburbs, but in which there were no jobs, and in which education was fundamentally inadequate. And so King said, if we're gonna address racial equality, we've got to address structural economic inequality. We've got to address poverty. That was his first point. Here's his second. If we as a country are serious about poverty, this will have benefits across race lines. Every poor person of every color will benefit. And simultaneously, this will require a coalition across race lines. It's going to need a multiracial coalition to really push for a sustained engagement with issues of structural economic inequality. Third point, and this I want to really reiterate or really hammer because so many of us on the left have forgotten this one. If we're going to cure poverty, we're going to need government. That it's government alone in an advanced, enormous society like ours that has the resources, political and economic, to actually solve poverty. And so this is, this is King saying, where do we go? And he's saying, we need to address poverty, it needs to be a multiracial coalition, and it needs to present demands on government. Okay, and so this is King in 67 saying, where do we go from here? 
And one version of my talk could, could be this vision, that the connection between race, de democracy, and economic inequality is the connection between racism, entrenched poverty for communities of color, the need for a multiracial coalition that makes demand on government, a functioning democracy, and the, role, and the responsibility of government in solving economic inequality. That could be the speech I'm giving. And let me tell you, I bet you 99% of the conversations you hear about race are some version of that speech. I'm going to talk about race, but I'm going to talk about a different vision. I'm going to talk about the chaos part of what King was warning against. And I'm going to explain a phenomena that he intuited but didn't fully grasp. I'm going to talk about this graph. And this is the most boring slide I have. <laughs> so I just want to get it out of the way early. OK, so this is a slide. I borrowed it from Robert Reich's fabulous documentary, uh, Inequality for All. Right? If you haven't seen that documentary, go see it. Fabulous. This graph is the share of income held by the top 1%. Let me, let me simplify it. High numbers are bad. <laughs> Low numbers are good. High numbers mean the top 1% control more of the income of the country. Low numbers mean income is more widely distributed. And what you see is increasing income inequality, declining inequality, through the 30s and the 40s, that's partly Great Depression, partly government policy, New Deal. And then right around 1980, these surging numbers. And it takes us up through 2007, that's a little bit dated, that's the economic, the financial crisis, but you all know that 95% of the recovery since 2007 has gone to the top 1%. And right now, we are at levels of wealth inequality that we haven't seen in over a century. This is a story of economic calamity befalling the white community. And the story I'm going to tell is a story that says it's race, and in particular, dog whistle politics, politicians stampeding white voters through the use of coded references, coded reference to illegal aliens, to, to gangbangers, to thugs, to the silent majority, to the real Americans, to the heartland. These are all dog whistles, a dog whistle in the sense that it's silent on one level. It doesn't explicitly say black or white or brown, but on another level, triggering a strong reaction. This is dog whistle politics. This is politicians stampeding white voters through coded racial appeals in a way designed not just to win, but to build support for the policy preferences of billionaires. Or to give you a shorthand version, imagine someone entering the national stage claiming the first African American president is actually not born here, come rising to prominence by peddling the birther myth, announcing his candidacy by promising, by, by threatening that Mexicans are rapists, by promising to build a wall, by promising to exclude all Muslims. Vote for me, he says, when he's a billionaire and who, upon election, appoints a cabinet of billionaires. That's dog whistle politics, the use of race to win popular support for the preferences of billionaires in a way that ultimately degrades democracy and dramatically engenders economic inequality for whites, too. Right? So this is a race story about the harm race does to all of us, including whites. And I want to start it here, go, go back again, back to the era of, of, of Martin Luther King. This is going to be a campaign commercial from Lyndon Johnson. He's running for president in 1964. This is important because, and I'll just say this, I'm going to say this several times because to me it's mind-boggling. Lyndon Johnson in 1964 is the last Democratic candidate for president to win a majority of the white vote. Not since the era of Martin Luther King, right? That, for all of you, that distant historical figure who comes right after the dinosaurs and right before, you know what I mean? It's like that distant, you gotta go back that far 
for the last time, a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. And who was Johnson and what was he promising? I want you to watch his campaign commercial. And let us, let us regret that the sound is not working. I wonder if we have a technician. That's okay. It's, it's okay. I'll narrate it in a second. I just want you to watch the images. So this is a campaign commercial on poverty. You notice the faces. Well, st stop for a second. When you hear the phrase poor people today, does it come with a racial image? And if you hear the phrase middle class, does that have a racial image associated with it? So what you see here is Lyndon Johnson saying we need a war on poverty, but the poor people are presented as overwhelmingly white children. And he's building on the, the, the sort of New Deal sense that activist government needs to help re, needs to help create the middle class. And he's saying, we have a moral obligation to end poverty. And he says in this campaign commercial, poverty, it's not a trait of character. It's not a function of heredity. It's a function of circumstance. And we have the power and the moral obligation to end it. Notice, not a function of culture. Poor people aren't poor because they have a defective culture. Not a function of heredity. Poor people aren't poor because they're racially inferior. It's circumstance. And we have an obligation to end it. And he wasn't just saying abstractly, <clears throat> excuse me, sometime. This is 1964, and he's saying we should end poverty by the bicentennial, by 1976. And he calls on whites to vote. That's what, the, that's what it looked like. Here, and so a, a lot, some of you, at least, I'm sure, were Bernie supporters, right? Bernie, who promised free education, this guy's promising to end poverty, right? Bernie looks like this total centrist Democrat, you know, part of the DNC kind, right? This guy's totally, we're going to end poverty. Massive, massive landslide. And people at the time in 1964 say, we are fundamentally a liberal country. We are fundamentally a country that believes in the power and responsibility of activist government to use its resources and to use its power to end poverty. But at the same time that they were saying that, there was an alarm bell. And it's in some of, that, some of those red states. Now, one of those red states, that's Arizona. That's the home state of the 1964 Republican candidate, Barry Goldwater, plus it's Arizona, so they're going to do what they're going to do. The other five states, though, whoa, wait a minute. Those other five states, that's the Deep South. They're diehard Democrats. They hate the Republican Party, blame the Republican Party for what they call the war on aggression, the war of aggression, that is to say the Civil War. Not only that, but the Republican Party was really uh, is, is sort of, there's a lot of hostility to the Republican Party because it was a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, who was the first modern president to order federal troops back into the South to enforce desegregation remedies. So the Democrats, the Southern Democrats, they hate the Republican Party, and they're about to vote for Republican. They also love the New Deal. The South, even more than the North, had been economically devastated by the Great Depression, and even more than the North had been helped by the New Deal. In fact, one of the New Deal agencies, the Tennessee Valley Authority, brought electricity to millions across the South, and Barry Goldwater was campaigning, saying that he would bust up and sell off the, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority. He was promising to dismantle the New Deal. And so there's this big mystery here. These are the most die-hard Democrats, the most die-hard New Dealers, and they just voted for a Republican who promised to dismantle the New Deal. Why? 
the only text I'm going to show you. But it's so important. Barry Goldwater and the GOP knew that their positions were unpopular. So they developed a strategy. They said to themselves, white anxiety is rising in the face of what they call uh, the racial crisis, but what we know as the civil rights movement. And they thought, if we could appeal to whites, we might be able to break the New Deal coalition of the white working class, African Americans outside the South, which is the only place African Americans could vote, and Northeastern liberals. Right? Now I want to make a couple of points about this. Point number one, and this is really important, this is strategy, not bigotry. Okay? This is not a story of racist Republicans. Again, the Republican Party had been a leader in civil rights. Dwight Eisenhower had, for, had ordered federal troops into the South to enforce integration. This is not about a racist party. Or put differently, if there's a white man's party in 1963, it's the Southern Democrats who've used fraud and violence to effectively disenfranchise all African Americans. That's the white man's party of 63. This is not a story of Republican racism. It's a story of strategy. They made the cold, calculated, strategic decision that they could use racial appeals to break the New Deal coalition. Second point, and it's really important. They're going to become the white man's party in fact, though not in name. Because this is 63. This is in the midst of the civil rights movement. You can no longer stand up and say, as a national political figure, I'm here to represent the interests of the embattled white man. You can't say it explicitly. If you're going to say it, you've got to say it in code. You've got to use dog whistles. And so Barry Goldwater started talking about states' rights and freedom of association. Now, so I teach constitutional law. I deal with states' rights, federalism, state-federal relations. You know, and, and I can actually, I can just watch, you know, if I, as I just keep talking about federalism, about half of you will be asleep in under 30 seconds. Can you imagine a national campaign on state federal relations? God, give me a break. Unless everybody understands that state federal relations means the right of southern states to resist the federal order of integration. And freedom of association? Like free to be, we get to choose our friends? What? But everybody understood freedom of association meant the right of white business owners to continue to exclude blacks, the right of white homeowners to not sell or rent to African Americans. These were dog whistles. And the warning, those red states, those were the five deep south states with the largest African American populations. And the warning was that the most diehard New Dealers, the most diehard Democrats could be convinced to abandon the Democratic Party, abandon activist government, if appealed to in racial terms. That was the warning of 64. How did it play out? It wasn't clear in 1968 when Richard Nixon first ran for president. But by 1970, number crunchers for the Republican Party and the Democratic Party had looked at exit polls, had looked at the results, and both parties said, yeah, race can be used as a wedge issue. And Nixon, starting in 1970, he pivots, and he begins to run a full dog whistle campaign. And you might recognize some of these phrases. He starts to go on, yeah, about freedom of association. He starts to talk about forced busing. That was the northern analog of states' rights. Forced busing, as if the issue were putting children on buses, rather than the school integration the busing was designed to achieve. But he also starts to talk about the silent majority and law and order. And if any of you inflicted upon yourself the watching of Trump's uh, uh, convention speech, it was law and order and the silent majority. Did Nixon know when he was using those phrases that he was dog whistling. Were we just making this up? No, he knew. We actually have him watching one of his own campaign commercials on Law and & Order and saying, yep, that's it. 
That hits it right on the head. It's all about law and order and those damn Negroes and Puerto Ricans. He knew he was race baiting. Would it work? Booyah. Lyndon Johnson won 60% of the white vote, three out of five. Richard Nixon, one of the biggest landslides in American history, won 67% of the white vote, two out of three vote, two out of three whites. Now, this isn't all race. The Vietnam War is going on. Some argue that the Democratic candidate was weak. This is not all race. Nevertheless, I want to say this marks the beginning of a sea change in American politics. Again, not since 64 has a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. That's the shift. Whites in the majority abandon the Democratic Party right then, right there. Today, today's GOP draws 90% of its support from white voters. Nine out of 10 people who vote for the Republican Party are white. 98% of elected Republican officials are white. We as a country are 62% white. You don't get numbers that stark as we see in the Republican Party today by accident. You get them as a matter of strategy. Right, the strategy way back of 63 of becoming the white man's party, that's who the GOP has become. GOP today is whiter than most country clubs. <laughs> they did that on purpose, right? And this marks the change. Okay. I hope you don't think that's too bleak because that's not the bad part. <laughs> We're getting to the bad part now. Because what you see with Nixon what you see with Nixon is the power of race to win votes, the power of race to shift party realignment, to, to, to push party realignment. But the core of dog whistle politics, not just winning votes, the core of it is building popular support for the preferences of the very rich, right? Nixon, Nixon had been what, I mean, you don't even recognize this phrase, sounds like an oxymoron now. Richard, Richard Nixon had been a, 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 a moderate Republican. Ronald Reagan gets his start as, in politics as a spokesperson for Barry Goldwater. He's a hardliner like Goldwater, another uh, um, uh, opponent of the New Deal who wants to dismantle activist government, who wants to reshape the policies of the country in a way that favor corporations. Okay, so this is Ronald Reagan, the happy warrior, and look at him. He's delighted. He's ha look at that smile. How can you not trust a man like that? Look how happy he is. Now, this is a crucial moment in his campaign. He has just come out of the Republican National Convention. He's just been the, uh, designated the official nominee for 1980 as a Republican candidate for president. And he's holding his first official uh, a rally and press conference to introduce himself to the nation as the official Republican candidate for president. And so he goes uh, here to Philadelphia to introduce himself. Oh no. Sorry, he goes to Philadelphia, Mississippi, which is, you know, the second most famous Philadelphia. I, I, who's even heard of Philadelphia, Mississippi? Except that Philadelphia, Mississippi was famous because 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers had been kidnapped, lynched, their bodies stuffed in an earthen dam and not found for months. There wasn't a voter alive in Philadelphia, Mississippi, who hadn't been alive when these three civil rights workers were killed. And Ronald Reagan launches his official campaign for president by going down to Philadelphia, Mississippi and saying, I believe in states' rights. That's his dog whistle politics, right? That's, that's the power of race to shift votes, to, to, to win support for the Republican Party. But how does this translate into shifting wealth from the middle class to the very rich? So Ronald Reagan, he used to look out at his audiences, and he used to, he used to use a story like this. He used to talk about welfare queens, but he used to use a story like this. He'd look out at his audiences and he'd say, 
I understand how frustrated you are when you're standing in line waiting to buy hamburger and some young fella is ahead of you buying T-bone steak with food stamps. Was it racial? First time he told that story, he didn't say some young fellow. He said some young buck. A southern term for a strong black man, one resistant to white authority. And a lot of people objected, said that's racist. And he says, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. And he switched to some young fellow and kept telling the story. And the story says, well, who are black people? Black people, they're lazy. They could work, they're strong, they're healthy, they could work, but they prefer not to. And they're not just lazy, they're larcenous. They'd rather steal from the system than do an honest day's work. Right? This is part of his racial narrative. But you understand, there are no races really. We're producing these as social inventions, and when we describe black people, we describe white people too, as their superior opposites. So who are white people in this story? For Reagan, they're good people, decent people, hardworking people, people who play by the rules, people who, because they're good and decent and working hard and playing by the rules, are struggling to make ends meet. And so this is the racial story he's telling. But I want to stop and ask you, who's the real culprit here? Certainly not white people. They're the good, the innocent, the victims. Are blacks the real enemy? And I want to suggest in, in, in Reagan's telling, the real enemy was his third character, government. Government. Because supposedly it's government that has made the decision that it's going to put its hands in the pockets of these good, decent, hardworking, struggling whites, take their money away from them in the form of taxes, and then waste it on these undeserving minorities in the form of welfare. Or it's government that's going to refuse to control these dangerous criminals by caring more about criminal rights than about victims' rights. Or it's government that's going to refuse to control our borders, refuse to protect good, decent, hardworking whites from these marauding, invading brown others. Could be Mexican, could be Muslim, hard to tell. So they begin with the M word, they're brown, they're dangerous. Government is the enemy in these stories. Right? And so the story Reagan is telling, he's saying to whites, fear people of color, but hate government. And if you hate government, Trust instead the marketplace. Right? And so he says, since government's the problem, starve it, cut taxes. And Reagan did, he cut taxes. For the hardworking, long-suffering whites? Nope, for the top 1%. The Reagan tax cuts in the 1980s transferred a trillion dollars of wealth to the top 1%. And we as a country have never repealed those taxes, those tax cuts. And so every decade since, a trillion or more is transferred to the top 1%. And if government is a problem, Reagan said, cut social programs. They're just being wasted on undeserving minorities. And governments have cut, cut, cut social programs. Not just welfare, investment in infrastructure, investment in our cities, investment in education. If you want to understand why, sensitive subject, but you all have so much debt, when you're going to school, it's because the state has withdrawn from providing free, accessible, excellent higher education. Cut, cut, cut. Has the size of the state actually diminished? No, because we're giving away more and more money to the very rich and we're, giving, we're providing more and more subsidies to the corporations. And finally, Reagan said, if you can't trust government, who can you trust? The marketplace, the job creators, deregulate. Did we get rid of regulation? No, we rewrote them. Or rather, we allowed corporations to write their own regulations. Back to the boring graph. If you watch the documentary, right, Robert Reich says, hey, three main policies lead to surging economic inequality. Tax cuts for the very rich, cuts in social spending, allowing corporations to write the rules of the game. That's Reagan and he sold it to the American people. There's broad support for these policies. Sold to the American people on the basis of a racial narrative that says, fear people of color, 
hate government, trust the marketplace. That's dog whistle politics, right? And that's the reality. And, you know, I could just stop right there and say, Donald Trump, right? Because what does he promise more than anything else? Massive tax cuts for the very rich, right? All of this, oh, we'll get to there. All right, so I'm going to speed up a little bit because th that's sort of dog whistle politics through the 80s. There have been some important changes. We'll find out if this change is accompanied with sound. It's not. This is, it used to have sound, but now it doesn't. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll worry about that. No, I don't want to do that. Shoot. We'll go back to this. Okay, so so this is this is a, a sort of this is a campaign commercial from Bill Clinton introducing himself to the country, and here he's gonna he's gonna make three promises. Let's see if he I don't know. Welfare can be a ch second chance, not a way of life. Hey, who is it who has welfare as a way of life? Right. This is him now saying the other thing I'm gonna do is crack down on crime, and finally he says I'm gonna cut the federal budget. Think about those themes. End welfare as a way of life. Crackdown on crime, government's the problem, let's cut the budget. Bill Clinton, so I mentioned in 1970, Democratic po uh, pollsters realized Republicans could use race to break apart the New Deal coalition. What did they do? They made a fateful decision to stay silent on race. They thought to themselves, you know what, this is just backlash, this is going to burn itself out, this isn't going to last more than a generation. They failed to see that it would be a purposeful strategy pursued by the GOP. So they stayed silent on race and they lost, lost, lost. Bill Clinton says, you know what, we need a different strategy. Staying silent on race doesn't work. What should our strategy be? Let's start dog whistling too. And if you, especially, I, I, I hope you've all read Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow, but if you haven't, you must. Right, to understand the scourge of mass incarceration. And the part of what she says is, if you really want to understand mass incarceration, it's Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton trying to, trying to play the GOP game of proving that he really is protecting white people against dangerous minorities, who's the one who ends up in a bidding war with Republicans to show who's toughest on crime, which is code for who's toughest on communities of color. Or, if you want to understand why the Obama administration deported 2.7 million people, a, a level of sustained deportation greater than ever in the history of the country, it's because Democrats play dog whistle politics too. And Barack Obama wanted to prove that he was tough on these invading dangerous brown others. Not that it bought him any credibility on that issue with Republicans, but he tried and he deported 2.7 million people. Okay, so one of the big changes is, Democrats look at the success of dog whistle politics and say to themselves, if you can't beat them, join them. Next big change. Dog whistle politics starts out of this deep national fear of African Americans, but it doesn't stay there. Especially after 9-11, it morphs, and Islam and Muslims emerge as a new racial boogeyman. Right, and I think so, so, and it's not, I mean, just, this image is important. It's not Islam and Muslim extremists in the Middle East. It's the idea that Muslim extremism is penetrating the heartland, is taking over the country. This is the notion, this is Kansas passing a law to prohibit its judges from relying on the Quran when they interpret Kansas law. Because apparently that was this huge problem Lots of their judges were whipping out the Quran and saying, you know, divorce law, but it, give me a break, right? This is, and it was also, you know what, 70% of, of Republicans believe Barack Obama's a Muslim. That's not just racial othering. That's a sense that whites are being betrayed at the highest levels of government by these insidious racial others who are, who are invading and taking over our country. So that's one. These are my homies. So I have undocumented immigrants in my family. You know, I mean, pardon my friends, but this shit's crazy. 
so there's been a long historical hysteria about, about Latinos and about Latinos who are undocumented. And California really played up that politics in the 90s. It really goes national in the 2000s. Part of the reason it goes national is because there are more and more Latino immigrants, and Latino immigrants are in more and more places. But mainly it goes national because the same hysteria around 9-11 and Muslim invaders was easily transferred to Latinos. And in fact, when you look at it, in fact, you know, you know so, so Donald Trump starts by saying Mexicans, they're not sending their best people, they're sending rapists. And you all know that clip. But if you watch the rest of the clip, he goes on to say, actually, we don't know who they're sending. They could be Syrians. They could be anybody. Right? Like there, there's, this, there's this fungible sense. It could be brown Muslims, could be brown Mexicans. They just they don't respect our way of life, and they're invading. That's part of what happens with undocumented immigration. This is a clip that, that I think some of you know. I hope all of you have seen it. This is Mitt Romney. He, he's, this is, this is, he's going to be captured on tape. Um, luckily, with this one, there's a transcript underneath um, uh, in case the sound doesn't work. This is, this is his sort of makers and takers. And, and I want you to, to ask yourself, is this dog whistle politics? OK, so, so I was going to, yeah, OK. Okay, this can't be dog whistle politics. It can't be, because he's talking about 47% of the country. He, he's, he's talking about half the country. And yeah, presumably there's a lot of minorities who have an entitlement mentality and refuse to take responsibility for themselves and all of that baloney. But he's talking about half, and yet, this is dog whistle politics. Compare what Romney's saying to what you didn't hear Lyndon Johnson say, right? So if we go back, Lyndon Johnson in 1964 in that campaign commercial about ending poverty was saying poverty is not a trait of character. It's not a function of heredity, right? He's saying the exact opposite. He's saying, listen to what he's saying. Mitt Romney in 2012 was saying, I want to be, I want to be president of this country and I don't care about half y'all, because half you all have an entitlement mentality. You have characters that ensure that you will stay poor. And that's your problem. You stay poor. I'm going to govern for the rest. Right? And, and now, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you know, he lost in 2012, just, just you know, catching you up on recent events. Not among whites. He actually did just about as well among whites as Donald Trump, right? And I want to suggest that, that what dog whistle politics has done is it has brought back into the national conversation, made acceptable again, the idea that we can dismiss poor people as unworthy of our concern because we can blame them for their own poverty. And that's an idea that we, that we reintroduced by pinning it on blacks, by saying, you know, there are a lot of poor blacks. It's not racism. It's not structural. It's not circumstance. It must be them. So we introduce the idea of personal fault for poverty by pinning it on blacks. But it doesn't stay with blacks. It goes to Muslims. It goes to Mexicans. And it goes to the white working class. Right? This is the danger now that we have a governing philosophy that says, one, fear people of color. Two, abandon poor people. Three, government's the problem. Four, reward instead the job creators. So this is Donald Trump. 
lots to say here. I'm going to confine myself to the most dire. Um, uh, one thing I will say, he's not a Mitt Romney, right? He's not a Mitt Romney. So Mitt Romney was still in this um, tradition of Republican po politics that, that's, that, that put himself squarely in alignment with the business interests and who effectively talked down to the white working class, right? And that's, that, that's a whole 47% clip. Trump introduces himself by saying, though he's a billionaire, that, but, that his billions actually make him independent of the other billionaires, and that he's actually a populist, and he poses as this, you know, sort of a populist, partly through his, his grammar, uh, partly through his constant feuds with the media, partly by rebelling against political correctness, so, so all of that. So, so this, is, this is not Mitt Romney. There are, there are some important differences here. That said, one important similarity. When, especially when you look at his cabinet appointments and when you look at his policy proposals, I guarantee you that the Trump administration is going to be very good for billionaires. He's promising massive tax cuts. He's promising to cut corporate and, uh, and the tax rates for the wealthiest back to levels we haven't seen since the 1800s. Okay? And even when you think about his infrastructure, now I won't get into the infrastructure plan and private partner partnerships or whatever, it's two, two in the weeds. But, Point number one, this administration will be very good for billionaires. Several other points. Trump is not like other Republicans. There is something deeply unstable about his character, about how he ran for office, and about the sort of energy in the public that he unleashed. And so again, these are, these are the most dire risks I think that we face, but I don't think, and I, I, and I think I'm going to articulate them, I don't mean to say that they're certain, but I do think that, that they are realistic risks. One, I think there's a genuine risk to our democracy. Manifest in the fact that we now have a significant cadre of Trump supporters who I openly identify with fascism. That, that part of, this, this blows my mind. There's a haircut called the fashy. And that the alt-right crew is cruising around with a fashy haircut because they're promoting the idea that solidarity among whites is more important than democracy. And that if one of those two has to give way, it's democracy. At the same time, and that's, you could say, well, that's all right, that's Steve Bannon, that's Richard Spencer, that's just a marginal group, even though Steve Bannon's right there in the White House. At the same time, watch what's happened with this idea that Russia has intentionally interfered in U.S. elections. How has the GOP responded? Or rather, I should say, how has the base responded? With this giant yawn. You, I mean, you have this... this significant segment of the American population that says foreign intervention in our democracy, I don't really care, our guy's in, right? That's deeply disturbing about what it pretends for democracy. Two, I think that Donald Trump is going to have to engage in something that academics call symbolic annihilation. He's gonna give billionaires a lot of money I think he's going to increase the financial pressure on most of this country, including on a lot of his base. And I think to satisfy them, and also because psychologically Trump draws on the energy and anger of his base, he will have to engage in symbolic attacks on vulnerable groups, right? I think not just mass deportation, but mass deportation as spectacle. So this isn't, this isn't ICE going quietly to pick people up. This is involving the National Guard, bringing in troops, bringing in helicopters, uh, you know, these factory raids. And, and I'm not making this up. George W. Bush did this too. Right? I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see symbolic annihilation as attacks on women as attacks on reproduction, you already see that he's moving very quickly to make sure that there's no uh, funding for uh, organizations abroad that perform abortion. I think you're going to see a lot of this. And I think what you're going to see also from the Women's March on Washington is that there's going to be a tremendous amount of opposition to this. 
we are really looking at, if, if, if what we have is a collision between a president who, who pursues assaults on vulnerable groups and an energized population that says, not on my watch, we're looking at a tremendous amount of social strife, right? And, and I, this is maybe too strong a phrase, but I think we're, we might be looking at race wars. Because I know that there are a lot of communities that will not put up with intensified policing or with dramatic immigration rates, right? And so, and so this is the spectacle that we're facing. Last of my most dire predictions. Yeah, because I, because and, and after this, I'm going up. Okay, so, <laughs> and and this is this is climate collapse. Climate collapse. Like like I'm not like this environmental guy, and you know, in fact, I'm pretty out of it. But withdrawing from the Paris Accords, starting up tar sands you know, putting in place somebody who doesn't believe that, that humans are contributing to, to global warming. We don't have very many years left before we hit this point where we can't recover. And again, this isn't my issue. I'm not, not organized about it. But just as someone who lives in the world, we turn this around in the next few years or the climate collapses and it's unlivable massive, seg huge segments of the world will become unlivable for humans, right? And, 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 and Trump's response is, drill, baby, drill. Or was that Palin? I get them confused, right? Okay. We're going up. We're going up. We're turning around. I want to suggest that we've never been at this historical moment in one crucial way. What we're seeing over the last 50 years is the power of racism, the power of racial fear, to convince many whites to turn their back on activist government and to embrace people who really serve the interests of the plutocrats. Right? And what that means is we are transitioning. We are in the midst of a transition to a no majority race, multiracial society. That is causing great fear and anxiety that can be exploited by the very rich. But for the first time in the history of the country, we can also say to a significant, powerful segment of the white population, racism is bad for you. You've got to join in forming this multiracial coalition because it's the only way to save your children. Right? And if you think back to Martin Luther King 50 years ago, he urged whites to join a multiracial coalition. But he urged them to do so primarily on moral grounds, that racism was a great moral evil. I believe that, but I also think you have more success getting people involved if they think they have a personal stake in turning things around and ending racism. Right? And so this is, this is where I want to end. We the people. There is a way forward. There is a way forward. And it turns out the way forward is a quintessential American ideal, a founding ideal, that we the people, that out of many, we can form one people. And that as one people, we can govern ourselves for our own benefit, for the benefit of all of us. That's the quintessential American ideal never achieved always a beacon of the way forward, never more so than now. The way forward is a multiracial coalition that whites join because it's in their interest to do so, that aims to take back government from the very rich and to create a broad and shared prosperity, right? This American ideal embraces American ideal. Now, I'm going to wrap up, and I'm going to wrap up by going back to Martin Luther King, and where do we go from here? In the book, King introduces a parable, or, or uses the parable of the prodigal son, who leaves his, his comfortable home and goes out looking for adventure and riches, but finds uh, hardship and destitution and returns home and is welcomed. And in King's use of this parable, he says, that home 
those are our democratic ideals. The ideal of we the people, the ideal of all people being created equal, the ideal that we are imbued with rights that come to us by virtue of being human beings and not because they're ordained by a government, that, that those American ideals are a solid, prosperous home. But he warns, whites have wandered into the wilderness. They've gone seeking adventure and wealth in the land of racism. And that they must come home. And I'm going to end with this quote. It is not too late. If America would come to herself and return to her true home, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, she would give the democratic creed a new authentic ring, enkindle the imagination of humankind, and fire the souls of all. If she fails, she will be victimized with the ultimate social psychosis that can only lead to national suicide. Thank you all. Sir, yes. I was surprised I didn't hear anything about fear of communism playing a role in this. It's such an interesting question. I, I think fear of communism, especially in the 50s and the 60s, was a way of expressing the notion of um, an insidious invader who's uh, hijacking a government. And you, you especially see it in the John Birch Society. And there's a couple of things that were remarkable about that. One is that John Birchers never more than a very, very small part of, of uh, society, whereas that fear of these insidious invaders is, is now half the voters. The other, I don't think it was communism that was doing all that much work, actually. Right? It, it was just some insidious other. And in a sense, that has been, well, listen, if you go back to the John Birchers, they always associated communism with African Americans and with civil rights. Now I think blacks, civil rights, racial equality, <clears throat> gender equality, LGBT rights, transgender rights, all of those things have become this insidious force that's ruining our society. And most surprising of all, it turned out communism was doing almost no work at least in the sense that you have this former KGB agent who seems to be, you know, to have participated in getting Trump elected and whom Trump repeatedly protects, and the base doesn't seem to care at all, right? So I, I think it was always more, this is the boogeyman. There's some boogeyman who's, who's invaded our country, who's, who's, who's somehow captured the minds, taken over the minds of our leadership, and who are betraying us. That was John Birch. That was 7% of the electorate. That story of an insidious invader who's taken over the minds of our leadership and who betrayed us, that's now half the country. How would you rate dog whistle politics in relation to Alan Foster Dulles' foreign policy in terms of covert interventions in Guatemala and also in Iran back in the 1950s. So, so dog whistle politics is a, is, a, is a form of politics, a form of using race. It, it's not everything that's going on in the United States. I think to understand uh, sort of covert intervention, um, that is better understood through both militarism and also a commitment to the, to the interests of the largest corporations. And I think that's the way to understand what's happening in Guatemala in the 1950s. This, this is actually in the US-Spanish War, so going back to 1898, and the United States actually takes over Cuba. And the, 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 um, there's a general who's, who has martial law over Cuba, and he's running Cuba. And a reporter says to him, um, why have we taken over Cuba? And, and, and the general says, to bring democracy. And the reporter says, how do you define democracy? And the general says, money at 3%. Right? And if, and if so this is, this is me being a bit cynical, but if every time you hear a State Department official talk or a, or, a, or a president talk about how we're spreading democracy, you substitute the phrase money at 3%, you have a much better understanding of US foreign policy.
Hi, Professor. Thanks for uh, coming to Villanova today and uh, giving us this wonderful talk. Um, I, I just had a quick question about, you know, from your research and stuff. Did you happen to, uh, I guess, find anything about dog whistle politics with, you know, the Asian community, you know, us being a minority as well? Absolutely. Um, um, uh, so, so th there's this commercial that I'm thinking about in particular um, of uh, Debbie Stabenow in, in, in Michigan and her, her Republican opponent runs this ad in which he has an Asian American actress portray a Chinese peasant to, and using sort of broken, heavily accented Chinese English, say, Debbie Stabenow, um, um, she's giving away things from China to, to China. We're taking more and more. Thank you. You know, right, right. So, so, so there's this effort to to try and use this fear of Asians as a way to um, tarnish Democrats. I would say so. That was in 2014. I would say that if you if you look at Donald Trump's campaign about trade, so much of his rhetoric about trade was heavily ra racialized. That that our enemies in terms of trade were Mexico, but more than anybody else, China, and he has really posed himself as an enemy of China in a way that, that I think connects to a deep-seated fear of the so-called yellow peril. Um, and in a way that contrasts surprisingly with his close relationship with Russia, except that when you look at some of his advisors, when you look at Steve Bannon, for example, there is developing on the right a new sense of a transnational um, um, uh, white solidarity, which sees Russia as key as a key force to that can be aligned with racial populist movements in Europe and with racial populism, white nationalism in the United States as this sort of new access of white countries allied against non-white countries. And, and, and in the sort of non-white country, it's China's going to loom large as one of the enemies that we have to defeat. And, you, and, you, and in a way that's it's, it's difficult to understand, you can see that playing out in Trump's foreign policy. Thank you. We had a question up here. I'm very patient. Hi, so I've seen a big increase in activism, in especially in young people, and I was just wondering, do you think that there's enough activism from young people and people of all ages to restrict the Trump administration to one term? Um, um, maybe, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Like, I, I, I wanna address a, 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 a slightly different version of your question. Activism in young people. So, so 70% of millennials say they're against racism. 70% say they're colorblind. And I want to tell you, they, they both can't be true, right? So, so if you've been reared in a way in which you never talk about race, but you've been reared in the United States, that just guarantees that you're, that you're imagination that your your worldview is suffused with racial ideas that you haven't really engaged with and you haven't really struggled to overcome and so i want to say of the sort of um of the young folks who who are entering the struggle so incredibly important so incredibly inspiring but you you all have to engage around race purposefully i do not mean okay so 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 here's one way of engaging around race there are some groups, a lot of them, community of color led, that say to white folks, you're welcome as an ally. You, we do not want you to lead, and we do not want you to join unless you check your privilege. I'm OK with that, but I just don't think that's a good strategy. I think the strategy for actually, <clears throat> excuse me, actually building a multiracial coalition is to say to white folks, hey, we need a multiracial coalition that includes whites and that includes people of color. We can form a coalition recognizing the damage racism has done to all of us. You white folks have an independent interest in joining a multiracial coalition. And now that you're part of the coalition, 
you should really think hard about your privilege and how it's worked in your own life. I mean, we'll get to the check your privilege part, uh, right? I will get there, but don't lead with that. Lead with, uh, to me, this coalition that we have to form, that, that, that if, if we're going to have a chance of limiting Trump to, to, to one term, we will need a broad multiracial coalition that includes whites. We're not building that. And we're not building that because I think the way in which race is presented by a lot of communities of color is alienating to whites. And at the same time, a lot of the way in which whites want to talk, there's, there's, there's this other big movement, and I actually think it's more powerful. There's a, very, there's a developing consensus among Democrats from some of the centrists all the way to the Berniaks that say we need to reach whites and, we, and that means we can't make them uncomfortable by talking about race or other identity issues, so let's only talk about economics. Okay, and I want to say two things about that strategy. One, it's not going to help you connect with white folks. Because white folks, they are stressed about the economy, but they're seeing their economic hardship through a racial lens, through a lens that says, I'm stressed because immigrants are cutting in line. I'm stressed because government's giving too much away to the undeserving minorities, right? So, so that approach, economics only, won't let you connect with whites. And you think about the crowds at the Women's March, or you think about the immigrants' rights folks, or you think about the Black Lives Matter folks, you think they're going to show up for a movement that, that says, we only care about economics, we don't want to talk about identity. That, that, it, there's no coalition possible unless we say we need a multiracial coalition that foregrounds how race hurts all of us, and that means we're all you know, we all have the deepest possible interest in forming a multiracial coalition that takes government back and becomes truly a government for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Go do it! <laughs> and then we'll, we'll take one question here and then we'll take one more from the audience. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. In your book, you talk about kick, punch, parry, yeah. uh, you know, before you, you employ a dog whistle. I hear a lot about gaslighting these days. Yeah. How does gaslighting either, is it a dog whistle? Is it a different thing? Um, is it part of that confusion causing? How, how do you uh, incorporate that to your framework? Yeah, that's, that's great. So, so punch, parry, kick is the rhetoric of dog whistle politics. Punch in the sense that you start talking about Mexicans as rapists or illegal aliens or Muslim extremists. You know, you're punching race into the conversation. Parry in the sense that when somebody says, hey, that's racist, you turn around and say, no, I was talking about Mexico as a nation. I, I'm not talking about race. Besides, some of them are good people. Or you say, I was just talking about Muslim extremists. Islam's a religion, it's not a race, right? So it's a period. It says, I'm not talking about race. That's, that's dog whistle politics. That's the point of talking in code. And, and finally, kick, because you turn around and say, hey, but you know who did mention race? You, when you accuse me of racism. And accusing me of racism is racism against me, right? And so let me just say, 70% of Trump supporters believe that racism against whites is a bigger problem than racism against people of color. And when they say that, what do they mean? Well, partly they mean affirmative action, but mainly they mean false accusations of racism are a form of racism against whites. Okay, so that's the punch, parry, and kick. Now, gaslighting is a version of it because gaslighting is that parry part that says, hey, you're crazy. So you all know what gaslighting is? Okay, so, so, so gaslighting is coming out of a, a, an, an early book about this guy who is trying, an early, early feminist book is about this husband who's trying to drive his wife crazy so that he can divorce her and institutionalize her. Institutionalize and divorce her. What's his strategy? He turns down the gas on the lights so that they flicker. And then when his wife says the lights are flickering, he says, no, they're not. You must be crazy. And she can see that they're flickering, but at the same time, she's got this person who's saying, no, they're not, right? Now, I've never seen a bigger gaslighter than Donald Trump, right? I mean, it's like, you know, he, I mean, he goes to the CIA and he says, media created the, the impression that I was attacking you. I was like, no, we got to just look at your tweets. I know you were attacking the intelligence community. Or, or he'll say, you know, my, my crowd was a, a million and a half. It was like, well, it was probably 150,000, so you inflated by a factor of 10. I mean, these are obvious lies, but then, it, but then you're kind of like, am I crazy? What is this person saying? So 
I think the gaslighting is part of the parry. It's to, it's to deny what we can all see, right? That. But I actually think gaslighting is a great term because so much of what Trump is doing is actually connected to gender, right? It's not just racial dog whistling. It's, um, I think this, this, this oscillation between what we might call hostile sexism and benevolent sexism. The hostile sexism are like the, the full attacks, right? Where, where, you know, grab them by the pussy. I mean, that's hostile sexism, that's sexual assault. The benevolent sexism is the same, you know, just locker room talk, you know, I, I love ladies, I respect them, I put them on a pedestal, so long as they're beautiful, I'll hire them. Great, I mean, th th so, so uh, this is the gender dynamics that are playing out here, and, and core, I think, to gender dynamics are men telling women, you're crazy if you think you're in a, a subordinate position. You're not in a subordinate position. I honor you. It's like, okay, but then, you know, why, why the restrictions on reproductive choice? Why the lower salary? Why the disparaging remarks? Why the emphasis on physical attractiveness for women but not on men? And the response is, y'all women must be crazy, right? That's gaslighting. And I think it's a huge part of, uh, sorry, huge, huge part <laughs> of who Donald Trump is. Yeah, we had. Um, my, so my question actually was about um, sexism, but in, in thinking about how closely a lot of these stereotypes about race are tied to kind of the Southern chivalry lynching culture that has become pervasive, um, how was that used, or was it used, I guess, to um, frame a lot of these political arguments? I'm thinking on the, off the top of my head about Roe v. Wade being passed in 73 during the Nixon administration and how this like political historical um, combination comes together. I, I think that that's, that that's a great question. You can trace, so, so, a core, it, it, how do you stampede, how do you appeal to white racial fears? One of the core ways that racial fears have been articulated has been through this hoary myth that black men are sexual predators who can't resist white women and who will rape them if given a chance, right? And so that's birth of a nation. If you think about Goldwater, one of the things that he did, j just as sort of political stagecraft, he would have these rallies in the South, and he would invite hundreds of young white women to come to the, to come to the rally dressed in these white ball gowns. And then he would have them like stand in the, on the stage or in the middle of this football field. And he'd look out at his audiences and he'd say, you know what you're defending. And the visual image is hundreds of young women in white ball gowns. Right, it's sort of white sexual attractiveness and, and uh, vulnerability personified. Or if you fast forward, George H.W. Bush, the first George Bush, he was down in the polls when he ran the Willie Horton ad. The Willie Horton ad was a, of an African American released on furlough who um, uh, kidnapped this white couple, beat up the guy, raped the woman. Right? And it was all about the black rapist. Or if you think about Donald Trump, what is the first thing he says to the country when he announces his campaign? Mexicans are rapists. Right? And so th this, uh, um, um, there is a very, th this is a, a form, this is this combination of, of sexism plus benevolent, uh, uh, sorry, racism plus benevolent sexism this idea that if you're appealing to whites, part of what you're appealing to is the notion that white women must be protected against these dangerous, rapacious people of color. That, that is very much part of the imagery. Okay, so I know that was, that was the last question. Yeah? If, 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 this is a slippery slope, because if I take one more, <laughs> there are 10 people out there that want to ask questions, so I'm... I'm cool, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Who do I choose? <laughs> Oh yeah, this this side. Okay, what you you call it? You call it. Yeah, if you want to take a, let's just take a couple more questions and then we'll and then we'll wrap up. It's cold out there. You don't want to be outside. Thank you for acknowledging this side of the room. I appreciate it. Um, 
I have a question about agency. I love your perspective on this. Um, so much of what you've talked today so convincingly about is the politicians and the elected officials and the party officials as the actors who are imposing on the voters certain ways of thinking and, yeah. and, and causing wedges in the populace. What agency do the voters have? What agency do the, uh, the white working class, the poor whites, have in, and how much culpability do they have um, in this equation and in this drama that's unfolding? Um, a great question. I think it's important to recognize that most folks are good people. Even people who are deeply steeped in racism, who support violence in order to perpetuate racial hierarchy. And I know that this is hard, but most people do not think, most people find themselves raised in and enmeshed in a social setting in which they are taught deeply destructive lies about others, and they take those for granted as they struggle forward. Okay, so I think it's important to understand that most people are good people. At the same time, all good people have a moral obligation to think through the assumptions that they rely on and to be open to challenges that say to them, this is immoral, this is violent, this is dehumanizing. Right? And I think that that's, I think in some sense it's good news. Like if I thought, look, 58% um, of whites voted for Donald Trump. If I thought 58% of, of, of white voters saw Donald Trump the way I saw him, see him, and still voted for him, I would shudder for the future of this country, right? I think that, that, that in a sense it's, it's good news. There's this opening. Most of the folks who voted for Donald Trump are good people. And let me just say, you know, so, so I'm half white, half Latino the white side of my family. Some of them are Trump supporters. I know some Trump supporters. I know they're loving, good, decent folks. I, but you hear my views on what they've just voted for and how dangerous this is. It's important to recognize that, that, that people are good, that they're trying, that they're struggling. It's important to recognize one other, th this other idea that everybody has the obligation to think through the assumptions they rely on. One last thing I wanna say. No one can think through their own biases and assumptions unless given an alternative view of the world. You cannot think yourself out of a hermetically sealed worldview. You need to be challenged, you need to be pushed, you need to be presented with alternatives. And so I think that that's the work of all of us who are woke, is to say to folks, there are other ways of thinking about the world. There are other social, there are other human relations possible, right? And so uh, it, it's, it's partial agency. It's, it's being steeped in worldviews, but it's the responsibility to be purposeful and reflective, and it's also the dependence on the sort of proliferation of these alternative views. And, and I really think, this is what I say with this, the, 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 the penultimate slide, this is the best opportunity in the history of this country to present an alternative view to whites that says racism's destroying the future for your children. Rethink how you've engaged the social and political world. Participate in a multiracial democracy. Participate in the ideal of we the people genuinely open to people of all colors, of all creeds, of all sexual orientations, of all genders, right? This is why it's so important for us that we develop a new narrative that, that we can share, that we can spread to really genuinely give people an alternative. And now if they turn around and say, I like my fashy haircut, <laughs> I, you know, not a good person. Let's leave it there. One, one last question, I think. Okay, we, it's gonna have to be very quick because I'm responsible for making sure you get food tonight. Ah, I gotta eat. <laughs> and we have a table with some books afterwards. So this oh, okay. is gonna be very, very quick. All right. I'll make it quick. Uh, 
So when Obama was elected president, there were the Tea Party movement emerged because they were all afraid of taxes and, uh, in, and the increases. Do you think that on the left, uh, the left will have their own Tea Party movement in response to Trump and all the things that he stands for? Great question. So, so, so I would say, look, Tea Party movement emerges out of grassroots resentment. I don't think it was primarily about taxes. I think that was a convenient expression for racial fear. Um, I do think that part of what animates the Tea Party is grassroots concerns, but a significant part is a media organ, Fox News, that was able to amplify and channel that message, and then even more importantly, a funding apparatus, the Koch Brothers Americans for Prosperity. So you see this grassroots movement emerging uh, in, in the Women's March, for instance, but at the same time, we need to create media organs that can amplify the message, and I think there it's, it's gonna be social media, but all of you who are like social media folks, um, think hard about how do you amplify the message, and we're gonna need funding. Now, the Koch brother model is the corporate billionaires, the family dynasties, but the Bernie model is small donations aggregated across millions of people. When you're hit up for five bucks to help launch some progressive organization to challenge you know, incumbent Democrats to whatever, to help fund the movement, your five bucks really matter, right? Because that's the new model and that's the only way that we can actually create a successful left Tea Party that can reform the Democratic Party and they can, can sort of uh, articulate a new, vi we the people, and I'll stop right there.